In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, good morning. Good morning. Christ is in our midst. Allow me to begin today with a little parable, a story that I think most of you might remember, but and some of you have heard and some of you have not. So I want to begin with this one because it's such a good one. So there was a man who wanted to know what heaven was like and what hell was like. And he wanted to understand the difference, why a heaven and why a hell. And what is this difference? And so an angel was sent to him from heaven above to show him. And the angel comes to him and says, come, let me give you an example. And so he takes him into the first place, a beautiful, ornate, wonderful banquet room, kind of like the gala we had last night, fully, fully furnished with everything wonderful, but in this, and think of this, there's a round table, okay? Round. It, you, we all sit at it, and we can see one another, okay? It's kind of neat, like, you know, when we do a gala, we'll have, like, round tables, too, right? In our hall, we have round tables, so we can see one another, so we can look into each other's eyes. And on this table was everything good to eat and everything that they wanted to eat. Everybody's favorite food was right there, right? Okay? And yet, he sees that the people are unhappy. They're crying, they're upset, they're angry, they're shouting, and they're unsatisfied. And they're trying to understand, and the man was saying, why? Why? I don't understand. They've got everything in front of them to sustain them and to rejoice. I mean, there's even every type of drink. Why? It doesn't make any sense, right? We know this story, remember? And he says, and what happened? And he says, well, and, then, and, he said, and the man said, what is this? And this is, this is hell. Because it's all there in front of them. It's all there for them but they're unable to rejoice in it. Why is it? Why aren't they eating? They said, notice, their arms were like this. So th there was one way that they could only eat. Their arms were locked. Got it? I cannot bend my elbow there. Got it? Like this. They had the utensils to eat, but they couldn't put it into their mouth. Follow? So everything was there in front of them. Everything they could want to drink, but it spills. The food, it throws. They're in torture. Got it? Unsatisfied. All right. The angel said, let's leave this place. We go to another room. Right? Same room. Same exact look. Beautiful, ornate, same table, same favorite foods for everybody, same drink, right? This time, they're happy and satisfied and enjoying one another's company and rejoicing in that company. Why? And he goes, well, look, I mean, is it because of their elbows? He goes, no, they've still got their elbows locked. Is it their utensils? No, the utensils are still the same. Why? And he said, the difference here, notice, look closely. And what was it, Gabriel? What is it? They fed each other. The people that had their locked arms, when they realized that they could not feed themselves, that they could not rejoice in what was in front of them, realized they saw their neighbor and they said, well, I can feed you. And then the neighbor said, I'll feed you too. Isn't that beautiful? The same situation, the same setting, everything is the same, yet the character, the heart, the love. And remember, every time Christ performs a miracle, the compassion was there for those people. 
but the other people who are in hell, it, they never thought of feeding their neighbor. In today's Gospel reading, we have a man who is rich. He is rich and he lives richly and he eats sumptuously. I love the adverb, sumptuously. And he has on purple robes, which were the finest robes of the time. If you had the royal purple, you had the best. He had everything he could ever want. And he had Lazarus right there at his gate. And he would pass by Lazarus all the time. Lazarus was poor. He was not eating sumptuously. He didn't have any beautiful robes. In fact, he had terrible sores that were clothing his, his flesh. And the sores were so bad that the dogs had pity on him. The dogs. And they licked his sores to try to make him better. Can you imagine the dogs, the wild dogs, going up to him? to make him feel better while the rich man keeps passing by. St. John Chrysostom says that notice that in Scripture the Lord is trying to show us that this Lazarus, first he has a name. So not only does God know him, but you and I know him by name. But the rich man, we don't even know his name. Which means, does God know his name? God knows him, of course, we know that. But does he know that he's known by God? Remember, our identity comes from God, right? He breathes his spirit into us. So anyway, so then he, we know his name. The other thing is, is, the, is, the, is Lazarus complaining? No. Is Lazarus at all Besides complaining, is he angry? No. Is, he's not complaining. He's not angry. Is he violent? All of the things that you could think of that could happen are still not happening with Lazarus. And that's when St. John Chrysostom especially will say, notice the virtue and the character of this Lazarus. That even though he's in this state, he continues with faith, hope, and prayer. And that he's continuing steadfast, and that he's not allowing himself to be a victim. He's not allowing himself to be angry against the rich man. He's not allowing himself to say he's a victim of the society. And he's not allowing himself to be an angry, not only not angry, but also to be violent in any way. In every single way, he is innocent and blameless. And this is why, this is why it seems right to you and me, right, that when he dies, he be given every gift from above. Don't you think? Don't you think he deserves it? And we believe in a God of justice and righteousness, don't we? Right? The rich man was given every possible good gift. He himself might be the man, like we talk about, self-made. He himself might be the man who has Google or Facebook, you know, or Amazon. Amazon's thinking about coming to Austin, right? We're in the running. $4.9 billion to be invested in this 50,000 jobs. I have to say, I'm thinking about it. I like it. You know, I know people say, no, Father, it'll destroy Austin. We already have too much traffic. But, you know, there's a part of me that likes the idea of the growth, that likes the idea of, of, of our people coming and having a greater city. Is that bad? Let me ask a question. Did the rich man not go to heaven, to the bosom of Abraham, because he was rich? Yes, no. How many say yes? How many say no? Right. Did the poor man, Lazarus, go to heaven because he was poor? How many say yes? 
How many say no? So we know that it wasn't because he was rich or poor. Aha. Uh -huh. See, the rich man, you're right. The rich man, but this is the difference. The rich man was very wealthy and he feasted sumptuously. And in the gospel it says, Abraham tells him, you were given every good thing. And Lazarus, evil things, even. Evil, bad, evil things. And it's right now for Lazarus to receive. Because Lazarus, even though he didn't have all those things, filled himself with faith in God. Right? Filled himself with everything. When you are empty, you have to fill yourself up. And blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who are empty, because they shall be filled. Okay? We can be filled with our faith to let God pour His heart through the Holy Spirit, pour His love through the Holy Spirit in us. The rich man allowed all that he was feasting on to be the only thing that filled him. Does this make sense? The only thing that he saw. He only saw those things and didn't think of heaven and didn't think of God. And he saw only those things and didn't even notice his man, Lazarus. He knew him, though, because when he went into Hades, right, across the chasm, he looks and he sees Father Abraham, and he calls out to him, which is neat. We can see and recognize each other in the next world. That's important to know. We do see and recognize each other. The saints are right here on these icons to show you that they do see you and know you and recognize you, and then are inviting you to the banquet of heaven to be with them. And they're trying to say, let us show you the way. And we are praying for you, because we want you to know the way. And even now, this rich man, he himself is begging. He's saying, let me go back to my brothers, because I regret. I am in pain. I am in sorrow. I want Lazarus whom I do recognize because I know that I was passing him by. Can you imagine? He recognizes Lazarus. He says, Abraham, tell Lazarus to put some water. He recognized Lazarus and he still said no. He recognized his state and he still turned his back. He saw how low he was and he hardened his heart like Pharaoh. And he became self-absorbed in his own riches and his own life. And unfortunately, that mansion of his became his tomb. And his heart was full of everything but compassion and the love of God. And then besides that, humility. Think about it. How do we get to heaven? Heaven starts right here. Right in here with our action. Luke chapter 17, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he meant you personally, as I love to say. And so the only way is for us to become like that parable. If I cannot be filled with what I want, do I see my neighbor and try to feed my neighbor and take care? Do I have openness for God and His love and compassion? Selflessness, an empty space to fill it with God's grace for the other? Do I? Because if I do, then I'm, at least I can be living in God. But if I'm closed and I'm thinking only of myself, then I become a person who is not able to be in communion. In our church, the apex of the liturgy is not a sermon. It's Holy Communion. Because it is a, something beyond anything that we can speak about or understand. 
It is the mystery of mysteries that somehow God himself says, this is my body and this is my blood with the bread and the wine. And he changes it to really his body and blood. And he says, I want to be in you. I want to be one with you. I want you to trust me and love me and let me make you me and I become you. I want to, as the epistle says, a new creation. It's not circumcision of the flesh like they're talking about in the Old Testament. It's the circumcision of the heart. And it's not just showing on the outside like riches or whatever, but it's what's on the inside. And am I a new creation? Are you a new creation? And are we in the new creation part of one body? Yes. Do we look at each other? Yes. Do we love each other? Yes. Do we care for each other? Yes. Do we weep with those who weep? Yes. And rejoice with those who rejoice? Do we try to be like St. Paul said, all things to all people? We are here to be in communion. So when I take that body and blood of Jesus Christ, I know I'm not fully who I am unless I humbly admit it and say I'm empty. Come in. Fulfill everything that is lacking in me. Forgive me for my sin. Make me today new, a new creation. Let me be circumcised in my heart. And Lord, as you come into me, let me realize now there's a communion with all the people around me and that they're now my family, my brothers and sisters. And let us practice heaven, if you will, from here and love one another and be with one another, looking each other in the eyes, feeding one another, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and taking in all the Lazaruses that we see, so that when we can come to that end, that we might hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. Let me put you and over much. Let's feed one another. Let's make sure we stay in heaven here. This is a place where we come to, as you see up there in that icon, his table. And he is serving you and me. He is serving you and me. Let's receive him and serve one another. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grant that always being protected by your power, to you we may offer up glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now endeavoring to the ages of ages. Amen.